Hey, mister, do you want a seat? Do you want to sit down? You can have my seat, mister. I was on a bus in Dublin. I was reading a poem about getting old. It was written by W.B. Yeats, poet and a senator of the Irish Free State. I imagine he was rather a pompous gentleman. He was only 40 when he wrote this. I think he would like it to be recited like this. Though leaves are many, the root is one. Through all the lying days of my youth, I swayed my leaves and flowers in the sun. Now I may wither into the truth. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought to myself, well, nowadays people would just say, the older you get, the less fucks you have to give. <laughs> I, I heard a woman behind me saying, stand up and let the old fella sit down. I looked around, there was no old fella, but I was glad that they were teaching manners to the young people. I started thinking, is it less fucks or fewer fucks? <laughs> fewer, fewer fucks rhymes, but I, and I think it's the right grammar, but people say less fucks. Less folks, or fewer folks. I felt a tap on my elbow. I was a little bored. Hey, mister, do you want to sit down? <laughs> Get out of my seat, mister. Do you want to sit down? Ah! Ah! It was me. I was the old fellow. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> and for some reason, what popped into my mind at that moment was the time I'd been on stage, and I thought, well, that was 41 years ago. So I, I did have time to get old. I was in the civil service in Dublin. I won't say I was working in the civil service. I was in the <laughs> civil service in Dublin. <laughs> we, we, we spent all our days writing letters to people telling them they couldn't get money from the government. Ahara. <laughs> Ahara. Ah it's how you start an official letter in Ireland. It's Irish for, oh friend. Oh friend, the Department of Education regrets that it cannot locate your application form for a scholarship and therefore you do not qualify for same at this point. It's Michel Amas, that's also Irish. It's how you end an official letter in Ireland. I myself, with respect, am Department of Education. We spent all our days writing these letters and then off to the pub at night, seven pints, crash out, up the next morning, do the same thing again. And then somebody, somebody actually said what they say in those old black and white movies. They said, why don't we put on a show? And, <laughs> and they said, well, we can pay people to teach us how to sing and dance and, and we can make up our own words, and we can make up our own sketches. We can hire a theatre and put on a show for our family and friends. And we did. I found the dancing very difficult. During the rehearsals at one point, I had 11 people in a line showing me how to do a step. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't, couldn't get it. And, uh, so during the rehearsal time, I, at one time, I really thought I'd got it. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> Seventy, and I can ch still gyrate. <laughs> okay. Um, but no, that was my warm-up music. That wasn't the, the song I was trying to dance to. They moved me from the front row to the back row so I could watch everybody else and try to follow what they were doing and come the dress rehearsal I really thought I had it. Oh.
George's dog goes mad when I do that. <laughs> <laughs> that was my vocal warm-up. That wasn't what I was trying to do. It wasn't a step. But come the opening night, I finally got it. I was able to do my dance. <laughs> faces while I'm dancing, so the people look at my face and not my face. <laughs> <laughs> now, 41 years ago, I was able to sing and dance at the same time. I don't, won't even try that this today, so I, I will sing now. <laughs> we made up our own lyrics to that show tune, and I'm sure the lyrics were all about how much we loved our jobs and how much we loved the Department of Education. <laughs> But if we'd been telling the truth, we would have been singing these lyrics. <laughs> Grab your pen, buy a quarter to ten cup of tea. Winter sugar's for me, no hard work. We just have to lurk. That's education. <laughs> Here till you die, there's no other way out. Unless you go mad and you scream and you shout. <laughs> Thank the Lord there is Guinness stout. Seven bites to feel better about that lost letter. It's a bore. <laughs> and your bottom is sore sitting there. On that old office chair, 40 years, 40 millions of tears, a waste of your life. Your life is a waste of education. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and at the end of the run, which is what we call a lot of shows done all together, at the end of the run, we... We left, we left the magic in the theatre and went straight back to Acharan. The theatre was called the Ablana. Now, Ablana is a wor word from Old Irish. Nobody knows exactly what it means. It could mean Dublin, it could mean Ireland, it could mean a town near Dublin. Nobody knows. In those Old Irish stories, the veil between the worlds flutters backwards and forwards, the world of magic the world of tomorrow, the world of whatever it is. <laughs> All the worlds blend together. And I knew those worlds from a book that I'd read when I was very small. I was only about five when I read a book of Irish legends and stories. And the one that I really liked was the story of Oisín. Possibly because it began when he was a very small boy. And in my five-year-old imagination, the opening of Oisín's story went like this. One day, Oshin's mummy said, Come on, Oshin, we're going to the shops. Oh, great, mummy, what are we going to get? We're going to get white bread and sugar, and you're going to have sugar sandwiches for dinner. Oh, I love sugar sandwiches, mummy, I love sugar sandwiches. <laughs> and so come along then, Oshin. And she took his hand, and as she went through the front door, all of a sudden, Queen, <laughs> two, Daddy must have taught him a lot of things. But the trotting off into the woods and the, the mummy going away reminded me of when I was at, when I was at my mummy in Pym's department store in Dublin. And I was just about to say to her, look, mummy, all these buckets, are, this was when I was five. Mm -hmm. Look, mummy, all these buckets are different colours. Mummy, mummy, couldn't see her anywhere. Mummy, mummy, where, where are you? 
I'm a lost boy in Pim's department store. What, what happens to lost boys in Pim's department store? Oh, uh, mummy. I didn't shout very loud, because I'm very shy. <laughs> <laughs> mummy. She came back. She came back. Probably it's only two minutes, I don't know. I saw her. Mummy! I, I, was, I, I was trying to tell you about those buckets and you know, different colours and you weren't there. You took me shopping and you lost me. You lost me. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Uh, she said, Jared Christopher Carl, stop making a show of yourself. <laughs> because in my mummy's world, the worst thing you could do is to make a show. <laughs> <laughs> But the next time she brought me out, she put the reins on me and I held on very tight so my mummy didn't get away. <laughs> but, yes, I, I was jealous of Oshin with his daddy, because daddy obviously taught him lots of things like how to be the greatest huntsman in Ireland. And I wished my daddy would teach me things. He played with me when I was very small, but then I was a bit bigger and I wanted him to teach me how to, how to hold on to the football when I got it so I could score a goal. I had to make friends with the other boys, but he was all too busy with his prayer books, and I didn't know how to ask him those questions. But Ashim, he'd learned a lot from his daddy. They were both the greatest hunters in Ireland, and one day they chased a deer all the way across Ireland, all the way to the west coast, to a beach on the west coast, and the deer vanished. Deers do that, apparently, just vanish. And Ashim's dad looked out and he saw saw something white on the western horizon. It couldn't be a sail because it was, uh, there's no ships on the western ocean. Uh, it, was a, it was a horse. It was, it was a woman on a, on, on a white horse. It was a woman with long golden hair, wearing a crown, riding a horse across the waves. And the horse also had a golden mane and was wearing a crown. She trotted up the beach, stood between Oshin and his daddy, and started talking to Oshin's dad and said, my name is Neve, golden hair. She kept doing this with her hair. <laughs> I am the queen of the land of the young, and I am in love with your son, Oshin. I've come to take him away with me to be a king in the land of the young. He will have a hundred castles, and he will have a hundred horses. They loved hundreds in Ireland. <laughs> 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 and he will have a hundred armed men and a hundred fair maidens. Now, uh, this, I didn't notice this in the story when I was only five, it was a very unusual thing for her to promise to her future husband, you will have a hundred armed men uh, and a hundred fair maidens. <laughs> oh, this is effectively your dating profile. What would happen if I put that in my dating profile? I'd go on a date and I'd be there, sitting in a restaurant. <coughs> Hundred armed men over here. A hundred fair maidens over here. <laughs> what would happen if the fair maidens all wanted to go to the loo at the same time and they start fighting? <laughs> if the armed men get off of the fair maidens, how could you split the bill? It'd be two hundred and one me. <laughs> but anyway, this all, all uh, didn't occur to me when I was reading the story. And uh, Oshin didn't pay any attention to what she was saying. He was just, oh. He was in love. Beautiful, long, golden hair. Oh, great big brown eyes. Oh, beautiful apple blossom skin. Oh, oh she's horse looked around. Never heard anything like this before. Oh, oh, I'm in love. Oshin's oh, dad, on the other hand, was very suspicious. And he asked Oshin to get down off his horse and come over and uh, have a word where the woman couldn't hear him. And he said, Oshin, as your daddy, I need to warn you about dangers that you will meet in life. And the main danger that you might meet is leprechauns. <laughs> There's many a man has been going home from the pub late at night and has heard the leprechaun's music <laughs> and instead of covering his ears and walking straight home he has followed the leprechaun's music and danced to it and he has gone to the leprechaun's party in the leprechaun's castle and he has eaten the leprechaun's food and drunk the leprechaun's drink and he has had a terrific time at the leprechaun's party and then the stars have begun to fade and the moon has set and there's a line of light on the eastern horizon. 
the leprechauns fade away and the music fades away and he looks down, his shoes are gone, his clothes are in tatters. He goes back to the path and everything is gone. His house is gone. Everything has changed. He's been away for 700 years. One night with the leprechauns has been 700 years in Ireland. And I'm afraid that woman might be some class of a leprechaun. How can she be in love with you if she's never met you before? What's going on? Oh, Dad, she's not a leprechaun. Look, you've got beautiful, long, golden hair. Great big brown eyes. I'm in love. I'm, I'm going to go with her, Dad. Oshin's dad realizes there's nothing he can do. Goodbye, Oshin. Goodbye, Dad. There's always a place for you here. I, I know, Dad, I know. Let me go. Are you sure? I'm sure, Dad, I'm sure. So he jumps up on the horse behind Eve. She's still talking about hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a hundred castles. Not now, Oshin. Not in front of your daddy, it's embarrassing. We'll have a hundred fishing grounds and a hundred ships. And she cuts off down the beach and across the waves with Oshin behind her. <laughs> and disappears across the waves towards the land of the young. Goodbye. Goodbye. There's always a place for you here. Goodbye. Well, my daddy never warned me about leprechauns. He was too busy saying his prayers all the time. And that was how he showed me that he loved me. He was praying for me, made sure I always had a roof over my head and food to eat. But he wouldn't talk to me. One day he said, do you know what Croke Patrick is? I said, yes, it's a mountain in the west of Ireland. Yeah, he said, yes, it's a very holy mountain. St. Patrick climbed up that mountain and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. And God gave him the strength to convert the whole of Ireland to be Catholics. And I knew that was very important because God had given me a white soul when I was created and that my only job was to bring this white soul back to God, as white as ever it had been. And if I did anything naughty, there'd be a black mark on it, and I'd have to go to the priest and say in confession and get the black mark taken away. So I knew how important it was to be Catholics. I said, yeah, that's, that's really good. And my daddy said, there's a chapel at the top there, we'll climb the mountain and we'll say some prayers there. Right, right. It'll just be you and me. Baby will stay down here with mummy. Ha uh -huh. you have to stay down here with mummy. Ha <laughs> ha your, your dummy and your and your dirty nappies and and you're getting everyone's attention. <laughs> so the day came and I'm going to set off. I I hid the baby's dummy so he'd cry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I looked him out and walked up. It's quite an easy climb comparatively to his path. Walked up the path. I thought my daddy's going to be saying his prayers in his head all the way up there now, but maybe he'll talk to me uh, sometime. Maybe at the top. When we got to the top, there's this little chapel. We go in, we say prayer in the chapel. Uh, up there, we come. Uh, we come out. He talked to me on the way down. I didn't know how to ask him these questions about how to make friends with the other boys and how to keep hold of the football. He's probably saying, still saying his prayers. We came down the mountain anyway, and uh, he said, "Right, we'll, we'll go back to bed and breakfast now and have a cup of tea." But Saint Patrick came down from that mountain and converted the whole of Ireland to be Catholics. We came down the mountain, and went for a cup of tea. <laughs> My daddy never did tell me how to how to make friends with the other boys. Oshin went to the land of the young, and everything was as he had been promised. And I only noticed, as a grown-up, that they skip over this part in the book because the book would have been written down by somebody who was a grown-up person who had forgotten about the land of the young. And when I was reading it, I was a little boy, I was, I was in the land of the young, I didn't know about it. It was, it was like water for a fish. So what, what is the land of the young? It's, it's the first day of the summer holidays. You're 10 years old. There's acres of time stretching out in front of you. You can do whatever you like. You can put a tent on the carrier of a bicycle, go down to the river and you can catch fish, put them in a jam jar. And if you, if you catch a frog, don't, don't put it in 
salt water because I'm going to die. Uh, uh, I can get a, a, a piece of rope and a tire and you can make a swing and you can hide in the bushes above the river and when somebody is going past in their boat you can burst out of the bushes and go Son of a bitch! Son of a bitch! <laughs> and watch them. And, and, and watch them. Scared and flopping their oars. It's like, what the hell is that? All these people. And you can... It's this football game. A few of you start playing football in the street. And then more children join in. And more children. And every child in the street is playing football. And, and, and you forget about the score. Nobody gets called in for their dinner or to do their homework because it's the holidays. You've got acres of time in front of you. And you go to the local youth club and Finn Lizzie are just starting off their career. And you're standing right in front of Phil Linnett, the first black Irish rock god. And you're right in front of me. <laughs> and you hold your babies for the first time. Look into their eyes. That's what the land of the young is. And despite that, Oshin wanted to go back to Ireland just for a visit. Just I don't want to stay. I want to come back here. But I just want to go back to Ireland for a visit. Now looking back at it, I think he probably wanted to show off how well he was doing. He was, he was a king in the land of the young. Uh, he wanted to see his daddy. God, just, 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 for, just for a day, but just for a day. Eventually Neve said, OK, you can take the horse with the golden mane, gallop across the sea to Ireland, spend a day there, see all your friends. And remember, you must not touch the ground in Ireland. If you touch the ground in Ireland, you will never return to the land of the young. I won't touch the ground. I won't touch the ground. Gets on the horse, trots down to the beach, gallops across the waves over towards Ireland. My Neve didn't come from the land of the young. She came from England. And she was on holidays. Uh, people from England and other countries, at the time, to Irish people, they seemed to have, not to have a weight on their shoulders that we had. And we felt this weight disappearing from our shoulders when we'd leave Ireland. And I don't know what it was, the weight of traditions, Catholics, and uh, uh, parents, I don't know. But she seemed free and everything. And we went on holidays, we had a great time together. It was like the, she had beautiful, long, golden hair great big <laughs> brown eyes. When somebody else said about her beautiful apple blossom skin, I realized I was in love and, and, and it was like the land of the young and I took a leave of absence from the civil service. <laughs> I came to England. I'm still on a leave of absence from the civil service. <laughs> and I went to England and I got a job at the council writing letters to people telling them they couldn't get money from the government. <laughs> always a job like that going. And so we, we, eventually we settled down and we got married and we had two children and I, I used to play with them very, very small. And when they grow up, I, I'd see them looking at me and I'd think, they must be thinking, I, I wish you'd tell me how to make friends with the other children. But I was too busy, I, was, I had big important books to read. I had not rare books, but big important books I had to read. And, and they'd be there and I'd see them looking at me tell me how to keep hold of the football when I'm playing football. I, I, I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't talk to me. I was like, big important books I had to read. But before, before I left Ireland, we had one last amazing party. We, Neve had gone ahead, so I, 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 was, I was on my own. <laughs> we filled the house with people. We filled the house with music. We were dancing and drinking all night. And I showed them, I showed them my, my sip with the shot glasses. I showed them how to drink vodka with the shot glasses. And uh, oh, they, they loved this, if they remembered it the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see the thing. 
I have some peripheral vision out here. Otherwise, I cannot see a thing. Uh, so I, I, I'll show you how to drink from shot glasses. If I need someone to help me, I have to. Uh, I have to have one person to help me, please. Uh, I can't see you, but I'll get you a round of applause if you come up. Thank you. Uh, right, I have to lean back, okay. and then uh, can you take the stump from the bottle and pour some vodka into each of the shot glasses, please? Stop her back now and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and sit down. <laughs> uh, and then I show them how you drink out of shop glasses. I get very wet here. <laughs> <laughs> Slow down for a minute because if I have inhaled some of this vodka, I will cough. <laughs> and that's alarming for the audience. <laughs> After the party, very early in the morning, my poor mummy came to take me to the airport. And I was this close to asking her to stop the car and it made me sick. Uh, she didn't drink and she was pretending that I didn't drink either. <laughs> I got to the airport. Goodbye. Goodbye. There's always a place for you here. I know, Mum, I know. Are you sure? I'm sure. Let me go. Oh. A couple of whiskies at the airport. A couple of whiskies on the plane. And a long time later, Neve told me that when she saw me staggering across Terminal 4 at London Heathrow Airport, she looked at me, drunk and hung over. Oh. And she looked at me and she thought, Oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a long time in the future. And we had, I stopped drinking. We had many happy years together. And uh, two children. Ashin. Ashin returned to Ireland. He galloped across the waves, he trotted his horse up the beach on the west coast, and everything, everything was gone. There were churches all over the place. There were people going in and kneeling down and saying prayers. St. Patrick had been and had converted the whole of Ireland to be Catholics. Seven hundred years had passed in the year that that Ashim had been in the land of the young. Everything he knew was gone. He said, there's nothing for me here. Turned the horse around, trotted back down to the beach. On the beach there were four men trying to lift a stone. And what Ashim's time, one man could have lifted that stone. Oh, we're trying to lift a stone, put it over there, sir. Oh, it's nearly up. It's nearly, nearly got it. Oh, yeah. We'll have to take a tea break. Oh, I can't. In my time, one man could lift that stone. Let me help you. I'll, I'll throw it over there for you. And Ashim leaned down and took the stone in his hand. And as he did, the saddle broke. And he fell and he touched the ground in Ireland. Ah! Turned into an old fellow instantly. Ah! Ah! looked at him as if to say, you were warned, trotted off down the beach, into the waves, across the sea, goodbye, I'll still be here if you come back. The horse would never come back. Oshin found his place in Ireland then as a storyteller. He told all the old stories, his own story, and the stories of the children of Lear and Hu Cullen and the cattle raid of Cooley. That's how we know all these old stories. They've been forgotten 
in the 700 years that he'd been away. And he told it to the people of that time and they passed it on to us. So that was how Oshin became, uh, uh, was Oshin's place as a storyteller. Now, uh, shortly after that Croke Patrick thing with my dad, when I was still a little boy, I had a real problem with the prayer books and things. And, uh, yeah, they gave me a prayer book, you see, my mummy and daddy. And there was a list of things that you might do that might be wrong, and you'd have to confess and tell the priest to get forgiven, because they'd leave black marks on your soul. And there were things like not doing what your mummy and daddy told you, stealing. Now, when I moved the baby's dummy, I just moved it. I didn't steal it. <laughs> so I didn't, have to, I didn't have to tell them that in the confession. But on the list of things, there was this word that I didn't know. It said masturbation. I had two feelings about this. It was under holy purity, so I knew generally what it was, might be connected with. And I couldn't ask my mommy and daddy about it. So my two conflicting feelings about it were, one, that I was... I was missing out on something. <laughs> some of the fireworks. But the other was that maybe it was something I was doing already and I'd be sent down to hell. My mummy and daddy would be up in heaven because of all the... And, and people would say to them, to each other, they would say, don't ask Mr. and Mrs. Carroll about Jared because he's gone down to hell and they're very embarrassed. <laughs> I wouldn't like to embarrass my mummy and daddy, so I, uh, I thought I'd have find a dictionary. Remember, the, the guys who invented Google hadn't even been born at this time. <laughs> there was no Google, there was nothing like that. But we did have a dictionary. Chambers, 20th century, especially for crosswords. I opened it up. Mastiff, a hunting dog. Mat, a piece of material by the front door. It skipped right over it. How, how can I find out now? And then I remembered Richard Foley. <laughs> you probably don't know Richard Foley. <laughs> No? He was a boy in my class in school. <laughs> <laughs> he had a little dictionary, but it had words in it that ours didn't. Now we used to pass it around because you know, our dictionaries went far sight, the ability to see a long distance, farther, more than far. Uh, his went far sight, fart. <laughs> <laughs> Printed print in the book, it says fart, it says fart, it says fart, and then it says an emission of wind from the anus. Anus, it says anus, anus. Ah. And we used to pass this book around in these innocent days. Pass the book around in class. And, uh, fart. Uh, if any, if any dictionary has this word in it, it'll be Richard Foley. So one day I said to Richard, can I borrow your dictionary? Now you want to look up fart? <laughs> so I took the dictionary. Fart, fart, fart. There was nobody looking that at it. Mastiff. Masturbation. That's there. Masturbation. Uh, uh, pleasure from playing with the genitals. Genitals. G. <laughs> Genie, an Arabian spirit. <coughs> Genitals, the sexual organs, for example. The penis. It's a penis in the book, it's pretty good. It's a penis. It's written down in the book. Penis. So I know what it is now. I know what it is. It's playing with your penis. So I, I was doing that already. <laughs> <laughs> Play with your penis. Play, play with your penis. And, oh. Say that in confession. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I was playing with my penis. <laughs> You'll have to speak up, child. I can't hear you. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I was playing with my penis. My mummy might be outside and hear me. What would happen then? And then I started thinking about this, this white soul business. And I thought, I don't know. What is this white soul? Where is it? And I saw these black marks. And I, it's just a load of rubbish. I just won't believe in it anymore. So I gave it all up and didn't tell anyone. <laughs> and, uh, I was quite happily going to Mass and going to confession, not mentioning it, and looking at the men at Mass and thinking, you play with your penis, you play with your penis. <laughs> and, uh, it didn't make any difference to me, so that was, that was it. Back to when I was grown up, when I was in England. This was my falling off the horse moment. When, when uh, 
our marriage broke up and Neve said I had to go and didn't want to go. I was on my own in England. I was, I was like a lost boy in, in Penn's department store. England is much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, what will my, well, what will my daddy do? What will my daddy do? I thought, well, he'd go to a priest, but I'm not a Catholic anymore, so what could I do? I thought uh, I could go to a vicar. Vicars, there are vicars. I found a vicar, found a vicar in the phone book. Do you remember the phone book? <laughs> <laughs> I, I went to this vicar and I said, look, my soul is all, it's all stains and black marks and things. And I've done all this stuff. What prayer should I say to make it all better? What can I, what can I do so that I'll, I'll go to heaven and it'll be all better? And he took a look and he said, oh, you did all this stuff, you know. So, nothing new to me. He said, oh, I've seen all this before. You, uh, you did all this and you... How many times did you play with your penis? <laughs> oh, dear. And he, he said, uh, well, what, what, what should I do? What prayer should I say to make it all better? Uh, and he said, well, have you thought about this? And he said, this, this white soul, black marks business, it's not, it doesn't make sense to you. I said, well, I suppose it does. Well, it does make sense to me, he said. <laughs> What you need, you don't need more prayers, you need a life, you need to get more life. What makes you, what makes you happy? I said, well, well, lots of things maybe. No, don't be, don't be wet, man. He said, just forget about all this, it's a load of rubbish. And tell me what makes you you, what gives you life, what brings you joy. And I said, well, the first day of the, the summer holidays when you're 10 years old and the acres of time spreading out and, and the, son of a bitch, son of a bitch. He said, what? <laughs> I said, well, you'd have to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, the, uh, <laughs> he said, oh, I heard that. I said, it's Phil Linnet. It's Phil bloody Linnet. I think you've done anything now. I mean, you look at your, you look at your babies for the first time. And uh, that time, when I was in the theatre, when I was able to make people happy and and sing and dance. <laughs> Magic's real, that's what I reveal. Leprechauns will dance on the lawns. Heroes' mums will turn into fawns. It's all amazing. I'm glad that I know all the things that I know. The big seven O, oh, I am raring to go. He said, <laughs> He said, you're raring to go, are you? I said, yes, I'm raring to go. He said, are you, are you ready to go? I said, what, what do you mean ready? He said, well, you're 70. Are you ready to go? Everyone recognizes me when they see me. I don't have to put on the deep voice. I don't need the sigh and the cloak, I sometimes wear them. Sometimes I have a laugh with my clients. I call them clients. Last Halloween, I met my client walking along the road. He was wearing a black cloak, carrying a plastic scythe. He looked at me and he said, Ha! Huh, I see we're both going to Halloween parties. And we're both wearing fancy dress. I said to him, my friend, don't make assumptions. <laughs> You'll find that neither of us are going to a Halloween party. And I'm not wearing fancy dress. He saw the funny side. <laughs> I don't always have to wear this robe of regalia. Can you meet me? I could be, I could be in a different disguise. Could be. Hello. <laughs> or. <laughs> beneath my dignity. <laughs> Often, I go about. I go around as a child. Clients find it much more reassuring if they see a child. 
uh, it's less threatening. It's less frightening. When I go around as a child, I travel with my mother. I was on a bus in Dublin. I was on a bus in Dublin with me ma, and I see an old fella, and I says, says I, ma, it's an old fella, can I take him? Can I take him? Come on ma, <laughs> come on ma, let me take him. And I, and she says, I, I don't think, I don't think you can, I don't think you can. Ah oh, ma, he's an old fella, says I. All right, says she, I look at him. She gets out the iPhone. It's, it's all on the iPhone now. There's none of this hourglasses and parchments and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the iPhone. And so she... It's not his time. You know the rules. You can't take him with it. Not their time. Oh, ma. He's an old fella. He's an old fella. Look, look. He's an old fella. Let me take him. Let me take Let me take him. Oh, ma. 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 Let me take him. Go on. Go on. Go on. She says... So she... Look, you can't take him, but you can give him a warning. And he says, what's a warning, ma? Hey, mister, do you want to sit down? Do you want my seat, mister? You can have my seat. <laughs> ah! It was me. I was the old fella. Ah! 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 When he was 70, W.B. Yeats, poet and senator of the Irish Free State, wrote again about getting old. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing, for every tatter in its mortal dress. music and done all the lights and cues, Halima. Thank you all very much for coming. Please tell your friends about the show. And also to I thank uh, Elf Lions for publicising this and tweeting about it and everything and teaching me a bit about clowning. Not that she's to blame. <laughs> and uh, and in conclusion, just finally, just to say, I'll be back next year, so uh, keep an eye on me. Um, and to quote my favourite Irish comedian when I was growing up, Maureen Potter used to end all her shows by saying, if you liked it, tell your friends. <laughs> and if you didn't like it, keep your breath to cool your porridge. <laughs>